This is FRM Part 2, Book 3, Operational Risk and Resiliency, and the chapter on Enterprise Risk Management Theory and Practice. Now, this chapter is a general chapter that applies to corporations in general and not specifically to the financial institutions industry. There are going to be elements and pockets of this chapter that apply to risk management from a banking perspective, and I'll try to make those links for you as we go through the slide deck. Let's go ahead and look at the learning objectives here. Uh, clearly, the most important one is that first one. Define enterprise risk management and explain how implementing ERM practices and policies can create shareholder value. So we'll focus on that during, uh, during a large part of the slide deck. We'll also talk about optimal amounts of risk, We'll talk about credit ratings. We'll also talk about maybe some capital structure. And then the last couple of slides, we'll go ahead and revisit material that we've covered in previous chapters, market risk, credit risk, and operational risk. Let's go ahead and start with a definition. And to do that, let me just remind you of some of the topics that we talked about back in part one and more recently in part two. Remember how we defined a business as having these different silos. In the operational risk management chapter, we called these business lines. And so each silo has its own unique set of risks. And so, as you can imagine, that each silo or each business line then ought to have its own risk management strategy. However, the traditional approach has always been to view those silos as standalone entities. But a more recent idea has brought the idea uh, the nature of an umbrella over top of those silos or those business lines so that somebody up here who's holding the, the umbrella, maybe it's the chief financial officer, maybe it's the chief risk officer in our case for a financial institution, uh, or maybe it's somebody else, and maybe it's a group of individuals as well, but you have somebody holding the umbrella who's aware of all of the risk levels inside of each of those business lines and is able to anticipate future relationships between and among the projects going on inside of those business lines and able to make better and more efficient and more practical and wealth maximizing decisions from that umbrella level. So we have talked about this before, but we may or may not, depending on what chapter we were in, actually called it enterprise risk management. So look at that first block point, a holistic approach to risk management. So you got these risks that are viewed together and coordinated and of course, in that operational risk management chapter, we spend a lot of good time talking about the importance of the board of directors. And of course, it's the board that establishes that strategic plan. So the board then needs to be aware of the coordination between and among all of those different business silos. So note the second block point, I have a, a, a line in there about the traditional approach in which each of these risk management decisions were made in a compartmentalized framework and decentralized. But enterprise risk management then brings this into a central trading place or a central focus. Uh, three features, of course, this makes perfect sense. People, rules, and tools. Now, I'm always interested in the difference between, you know, the big macro level viewpoint of life and the individual micro viewpoints of life. So we're going to have a slide or two about macro benefits and then, of course, micro benefits. But let's let's think about this from about this from a macro perspective. All right. So what is viewing? risk management as part of this entire enterprise and umbrella do for us? 
So senior management, the ability to quantify and manage the risk return trade-off. How about if I throw an initial one in there, identify and quantify and manage. We've talked about that many, many times in, uh, in previous chapters. What that does then is it allows us to go all the way back to 1952 and Harry Markowitz with his efficient frontier that traded off risk as measured by standard deviation and return as measured by, you know, some expected return on a financial security. And Harry Markowitz taught us how to form that efficient frontier, which was an optimal trade-off of risk and return. Now that of course applied to portfolio of securities like stocks and bonds, but that same thought process, that same mentality of risk management can be applied not only to the individual business lines, but also to the umbrella. And then the important part of this is that we're managing the risk individually and then coordinatedly. Is that a word? Coordinatedly. It's, it's a word now. Um, so, that, so that we, as good financial managers, have better knowledge and better ability to access capital markets. Because remember now, we're talking about corporations in general. And so what do corporations demand? They have this great idea for a new product line and they get their scientists and their engineers together and they say, what do we have to do to make this product available to the consuming public? And so once they get all those initial costs and initial estimates together, they want that capital immediately. So access to capital markets, highly liquid capital markets is extremely important for the success of any company. And of course, that third block point then sums up what I teach in my corporate finance classes all the time, right? What's the goal of the business? Maximize shareholder wealth. How do firms do that? They find projects that have positive net present values. Now, which are those projects that have positive net present values in general? I mean, without turning this into a capital budgeting uh, lecture, in general, it means those product lines that are gonna generate lots and lots of operating cash, right? They make something for pennies and they sell it for dollars. All right, so you think about that from, from the macro standpoint, then what about the micro standpoint? We have these individual projects inside of these silos. Take a company that we all know and probably have used their products uh, on a, at least I hope we all use their products on a daily basis. Take a company like Johnson & Johnson. You know, they have essentially three business lines. Johnson & Johnson has the consumer health products, right? So things like shampoo and soap, hopefully we use all that stuff. And then they have the medical devices line. Um, I have a, I have a artificial hip. I have a Johnson and Johnson artificial hip. And then the pharmaceuticals, you know, they're really, really on the edge of immunotherapy and some blood pressure research and all that kind of stuff. And so you think about this, you know, there are positive net present value projects in each one of those business lines. And if the risk management process is decentralized, you're going to have these individuals inside of those business lines who then are going to promote their own kind of a project. Right. And so think about this. You have one silo that has a net present value of 100 and then you have another silo that has a net present value, let's say, of 10 and then another one that has a net present value of five. So all three of those are positive net present values. However, however, you know, 100 is far greater than one than 10 and five. So you need somebody to hold the umbrella that says, let's prioritize these in their order of net present value and ability to generate cash flows. All right, so you see how the micro benefit is that you have these different silos then are competing for capital. And these projects are risky. So we need to be able to quantify the risks of each of these uh, different positive net present value projects. And so the person who's holding the umbrella has to be able to determine what is the marginal impact of those projects from a wealth standpoint and a total risk standpoint. And the only person can do that is probably the chief risk officer who's standing there holding the umbrella looking at each one of these at the margin. Here's a quick picture um, of the difference between central and decentral structures. Um, look over on the left, uh, notice that we've got light blue 
and dark blue over on the side. And what is that? A super dark blue inside of the, of the middle. So the risk analysis over on the right is that each unit analyzes its own risk in conjunction with the chief risk officer. But in the centralized format, there's going to be little or no risk analysis at the business unit level because it's done under that umbrella format with this risk analysis structure and the chief risk officer. Now, that doesn't mean that each silo or each business unit level doesn't know what their risk levels are going to be. Boy, this is a great question here, not just for financial institutions, but for companies in general and for all of us in our personal lives. Why is it important to establish the optimal uh, amount of risk? And of course, the answer to that is that if you if you don't know what the risks are, then you have no chance of being successful systematically over time. So establishing the optimal amount of risk that is uh, that an entity is willing and able to take then allows executives, including the chief risk officer, to at the margin decide which projects are going to be selected. And the textbook has a couple of pages on this idea of a buffer stock of equity. And what that means in the enterprise risk management structure. So think of a buffer stock as, as, as the term buffer, whatever that means to you in terms of an inventory, right? If, if you're selling, if you're selling uh, lawnmowers, you want to have a buffer stock of inventory of lawnmowers so that if 100 people come to your store one day, you have enough to sell. But then again, you don't want to you don't want to have a thousand lawnmowers there because then they take up space. And of course, it costs money to uh, insure them and all those kinds of things. All right, so what we need to do is find that buffer stock of equity. So let me explain this to you in terms of uh, what this chapter means from a general corporate standpoint, right? We have all these product lines. So if we're, if we're a company like Johnson & Johnson, we have our immunotherapy, we have our um, uh, joint replacements, and then we have shampoo. And each one of these is generating lots and lots of cash flow, or at least we hope that, that each one is generating lots of cash flow. So this buffer stock of equity, so think about what that cash flow does. Now, I don't want you to think about this from an accounting standpoint here for just a second, right? From an accounting standpoint, we've got that net income flowing back into earnings I'm sorry, flowing back into equity, which then will swell the equity portion of the balance sheet. And remember that the accountants, they can kind of massage or manipulate the data. What I want you to think about here now from a good financial manager's perspective is take those operating cash flows from the cash flow statement and flow those through uh, the equity portion of the balance sheet in terms of cash. And then they go right over to the left hand top portion of the balance sheet in terms of cash. So, so we need this buffer stock of equity, right? So here's the deal. If we have if we have too little of this, then these new projects that have positive net present values that are going to present themselves to us or that we discover, we're going to have to pass them up because we don't have the ability to go ahead and quickly finance them. Now, comma, comma, what that means then is that we may have to go to the capital markets and that that takes time and we may have to pay more when we go to financial markets. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. However, if we have just the opposite, if we have a buffer stock of equity that's too large, right? If we're hoarding equity or hoarding cash, then we're underestim uh, uh, I'm sorry, under investing and this has low value to investors. So what we need to do is identify, look at that third block point there. Firms must identify a level of earnings. Okay, so earnings, I just said that, put that in there for the accountants, but cash flow, that's important, that they want to maintain under almost any circumstances that will optimize the firm's risk portfolio. And so what this is going to do is it's going to, remember, I always do this, you know, what do we want to do with risk? We want to, you know, we want to squeeze that risk down to some manageable level. What that's going to do, optimal amount of risk is going to be another part of maximizing firm value. You know, where did we learn this maximizing firm value? We go back to 1958, 
uh, Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller. They did their optimal capital structure seminal paper in which they decided that, hey, firms should maximize the value of the firm. How do we do this? Well, I've said this to you before, right? We find projects that have positive net present value. And that makes a lot of sense, but that's like way out here in the cloud. What does that mean? It means finding projects that have lots of cash flow and finding projects that optimize the firm's total, ready, the umbrella risk portfolio. Now that was all fun stuff, but the question then becomes, how do we go ahead and identify that optimal level of risk that maximizes firm value? All right, so what we do is we use our regular old statistical and risk management tools uh, to try to determine what is this level of earnings or cash flow. All right, so I put both of them in that in that top block point that they want to maintain under, let's say, 95% of all circumstances or scenarios or events. All right, so once again, we're focused on that 5%, that left percent, that left tail. But what we want is that, okay, in 95% of these future events, we're going to have this much cash flow. And then when we hit that 5%, and we've talked at length about that left tail, maybe I should go over here. Well, it's over there for you guys who are watching. It's over here for me. All right. So we're over here on that left tail. And then we can use our tools that we've uh, discovered in previous chapters to manage that 5%. So the cool thing about this slide and this part of the chapter is it combines the 95% and the, and the 5% that we've been talking about. And of course, there's nothing interesting about 95%. It could be 97% or 98%, right? So that minimum cash flow serves kind of as a threshold. And what a lot of companies do is they will go ahead and rely on bond ratings to define this threshold. All right, so you know what do we have here? We, we know that we rely on Moody's and Standard & Poor's and Fitch to evaluate the default risk of a particular bond issue and then maybe uh, an entire bond ratings for a particular company. Now that means that if we believe in Moody's and Fitch and Standard & Poor's, then we believe in their process of evaluating risk. And then we believe in their output, which is, you know, let's say AAA and then AA and single A all the way down to, to single C or D, depending on which of those um, ratings agencies that you're observing. Now, the idea about this buffer and about the idea about this threshold and, the, and an optimal level of risk probably depends on not so much a concern about if the firm has an upgrade in its rating, but a downgrade. And so look at the example I have in blue here. We have a firm that's currently rated a single A, and boy, what happens if it would start ignoring valuable projects if the rating fell, okay? Well, the problem with going from an A to a B rating has tremendous implications for both the capital structure on the right-hand side of the balance sheet, but also on the left-hand side of the balance sheet and other financial statements. So look at the second block point I have there in the blue. It may be difficult to estimate that actual probability moving from an A to a B rating within some special period, but what we can do is we can use data from Moody's and Standard & Poor's and Fitch to kind of help us. All right, so let's go ahead and look at a table here. Wait, let me read that last thing down to you. Um, from 1920 to 2005, the average probability of a company having rated A and then dropping to B um, is 0.99%. All right, so this is what we're doing here. We're going to go from, from, notice the horizontal, I'm sorry, the vertical column, we go from A to some other rating. So notice the, the diagonals. If we 
are AAA, we have a 91.75% chance of staying at AAA. If we're AA, we have a 90.71% and so on. So, you know, so, so those diagonal uh, probabilities tend to, be, tend to be pretty high. So what does that tell you? That the overwhelming majority of bonds and firms stay at the same rating level. But what we're concerned about is a drop all right, so if we go from, notice I have there bolded over in red, we can go from A to B and down to C and down to default. You know, so what is that? That's all less than 1%, 0 0.76, 0 0.12, 0 0.03, and, and 0 0.08. And so we can use these Moody's or Standard & Poor's or Fitch historical changes in bond ratings to help us establish our optimal level of acceptable risk. Now, what we can do is we can try to figure out what that prob probability of default is during a specific period, say six months or one year. What happens and for us to do this then is to use sensitivity or scenario analysis to have these different scenarios out here that would cause a ratings downgrade. And then we can see how that affects the output. And one of those outputs could be uh, value at risk. Uh, look at this graph here before I explain it. We've got volatility of value at risk on the horizontal axis and then equity capital on the vertical axis and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how much how much equity do we need in order to remain you know should i say remain solvent or avoid bankruptcy or what we're trying to do here uh, to to identify that probability of default and so of course there's a trade-off and what this graph tells us, it, it gives us the amount of ca equity capital that's required to achieve a target probability of default. So let's suppose, suppose that we say something like, you know what, let's go ahead and we believe that we have a probability of default of 2%. All right, so as that volatility, you know, whatever volatility, however we want to define that in equity or value at risk volatility or value at risk increases, you know, then we have that red line going up and it's uh, it's not too terribly steep. But but I mean, here's the cool thing about this graph is that if we want to reduce that probability of default to 1.5, then, of course, we're going to need more of a buffer. Right. Makes perfect sense. We're going to need more equity capital. And so if I had a green line that had a probability of default of 1%, you know, we'd have to increase the slope of that relationship. All right, so let's go ahead and try to summarize some of the things that we've been talking about and then put them together into some kind of a system so that executives and boards of directors are able to implement um, this enterprise risk management system. Now, I say this to you guys regularly about the importance of the board of directors. And then inside of that board, there's probably some committee on risk. Right. So so you have you have the managers, you know, you got these business lines. So you got all these managers and then you have the chief risk officer up here and then, you know, you have the top executives. And so everyone. And we talked about this back in the operational risk chapter. You know, everyone has to know what's going on inside of the company. I mean, not everybody has to be an expert. I mean, you know, the men and women who make the shampoo for Johnson & Johnson, they don't have to be an expert on the uh, joint replacements, right? But they need to be aware of what are those specific risks. So you have these people up here, these really smart men and women, whether they're a combination of the board or management, that's going to determine the firm's appetite for risk, right? And there are two, two components to this, as always. There's the willingness and the ability to take on risk, right? So we're going to say something like this. I always like to use my hands. Let's just say this is our appetite for risk. Not this, this is too much, and not this, this is too little. So however we're measuring it, we're going to call it this right here. And we can rely on credit ratings or we can come up with our own ways to do to do this. All right, so what that means then is that a firm, in, in, including the 
risk ex experts on the board are going to determine what is the optimal rating or the uh, target rating. You know, maybe we're a triple B rated firm and we want to be a double A rated firm. That might be our target rating. Well, what do we have to do in order to achieve that target? Now, once, once that target rating is established, then we need to figure out what goes on on the capital structure portion of the balance sheet. Do we want lots of debt? Do we want a little bit of debt? Do we want lots of equity? Do we want a little bit of equity? And of course, that capital structure decision is extremely critical as part of the wealth maximization process. And firms are going to determine what that optimal amount of capital is. Think of it in terms of debt over equity, just a debt equity ratio, whether it's a company like Johnson & Johnson or a financial institution as well. Now, of course, the debt equity ratio in financial institutions is way different, as I'm certain you guys know at this point in our discussions, than it is for a company like Johnson & Johnson. And then so look at the third step. Let's find out that optimal mix of capital and then risk that is expected to yield that target rating. Now, look at the fourth one down here. This one I thought was really interesting as I read through the chapter. Um, what we want to do is we want to allocate capital and have a performance evaluation system that's consistent with, uh, with wealth maximization. And so we want to give managers an incentive to make investments and operating decisions that bring the entire firm to this optimal level of this risk capital trade-off. Now, how do we implement this? And I've mentioned this in, in previous chapters as well. All right, so look, I have in bold. It's a challenging process. It requires everybody in the firm. Remember our discussion in our operational risk management uh, chapter. We have experts here and experts here and experts here. So you have to bring about a culture that everyone is talking about risk management. It's part of the theme. When groups of workers go out to lunch and they order sandwiches, and by the time the sandwiches come, they should be talking about uh, ERM. Uh, look at that last block point there. The textbook mentions this, attaching some performance sweeteners for these uh, ERM targets. And so, of course, you know, one of the great incentives to maximize wealth is to design employment contracts so that these individuals who are working are sufficiently satisfied with their home life so that they can devote that time to their work life. And so you can always offer bonuses. I mean, you know, workers get bonuses for many, many different things, but this enterprise risk management bonus ought to be part of that employment contract. Now, what are some of the challenges outside of here? Let me just go back here uh, for outside of getting everyone to buy into the framework. Well, there, there are some of these other ones here. So remember, we, we talk about three categories of risk, market risk, credit risk, and operational risk. And so this firm must establish, you know, think of it as an inventory of those risks. There has to be a consistent way to measure or quantify this exposure. So there has to be, as part of this umbrella, a centralized IT system that can, that can vacuum out the risks from each of these silos and then aggregate them. And so think about, you know, think of a vacuum cleaner that's taking up the risks from each of these business lines, putting them into an Excel spreadsheet, running some Monte Carlo simulation and trying to find some commonalities among and between these kinds of risks so that um, the individuals holding the umbrella then can allocate amounts of capital to each of those business lines so, so that wealth is maximized in the long term. Now, we've talked about this in previous chapters, and I'll go ahead and mention it again. You know, Moody's and Standard & Poor's and Fitch, you know, these three ratings agencies, they typically do an awesome job of evaluating credit risk. The problem is that there's uh, the human element 
and the human timing and the time lag. You know, of course, of course, these analysts, they rely on the financial statements that are put out by the firm. And in some cases they can, you know, mix and match and try to figure out and put together their own kinds of financial statements. But essentially we're relying on this accounting information. And we know that accounting data can be at least massaged, if not manipulated. And so, you know, I have in bold there, it may not be reliable. Most of the time it is, but what we've learned is that when we need those ratings the most, this is when maybe, maybe they're not as reliable as we want them to be. That's why lots of good financial risk managers look to the derivative markets, like the credit default swap market, to use the prices of credit default swaps um, as a complement to Moody's and Standard and & Poor's and Fitch's ratings. Now, of course, the chapter doesn't talk about credit default swaps, but uh, that was a good addition by uh, my part. Uh, what about the accounting problem? Um, focus on cash flow means the firm focuses on economic value. Uh, on the other hand, more volatile accounting earnings. And so the accounting problem just really falls into the category of what I always just call the difference between the way accountants look at financial statements and the difference than the way financial analysts and financial managers ought to look uh, at the financial statements. You know, we're wrapped up in this accrual basis of accounting, which allows for all of this massaging of the data. You know, what a good financial analyst is going to do is look at cash, you know, cash flow, operating cash flow, which of course can be uh, massaged in and of itself. But what we want to do is we want to avoid unnecessary volatility in accounting earnings. Because of course, that's going to affect our decision and the level of optimal risk that we're willing and able to take. Now, of course, any good uh, FRM chapter is going to talk about some kind of distribution uh, if it is appropriate. And, you know, this is an interesting series of graphs taken right from the chapter. You know, uh, we tend to believe that market risks um, have normal distributions or at least symmetric distributions, which are probably kind of near normal. So that's that top picture there. You know, it looks kind of like the right hand side of a normal distribution. But credit risk and operational risk distributions are, are clearly uh, not normal and they're clearly asymmetric. And so we need to make certain that when we're evaluating credit, all right, so think about it, you know, each of these business lines have their own market and credit and operational risk. And so as we are going up the silo and as the person who's holding the umbrella is trying to evaluate each of these types of risk, when analyzing and measuring and then managing credit and operational risks, you can't use our traditional methods like, like a value at risk that relies on normal distributions. Now we've spent some good time in previous chapters back in part one and in part two talking about correlations and copulas. So what, what are we doing here? At present, there's no way, there's no way to measure correlation with a good enough accuracy, right? You know, you hear this all the time. Correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. The, the correlation coefficient depends on the time frame and maybe some other variables under which these are being measured. And so what, what happens then is that if you've got all these individual correlations between and among different variables, um, you know, one of a reasonable way to manage this is just to average correlations that are out there, either used internally or externally. And the chapter emphasizes this used by other firms. Now, this is where the chapter could have gone and it didn't. You know, we could go with our whole discussion of these copulas that we have talked about in previous chapters. And of course, they're going to be important inside of those business silos, but that's not a part of this chapter. But um, what we do need to make sure we're aware of, and I know that I've emphasized this in the past, and I'm guessing that you, that you know this. Look at the bottom there. Correlations tend to increase in periods of stress, which means just when we rely on diversification, just when we need diversification at its most, it tends to fail us. And that's why other measures of relationships between and among variables are extremely important.
All right, we're finally getting to the part of the chapter where we can specifically describe variables that are critical to a financial institution. Now, this has shown up in a couple of previous chapters, economic capital and regulatory capital, right? Regulatory capital is like this. It's the amount of capital that the regulators, right? These big picture men and women out there, these big regulators out there have decided that we as an individual inst financial institution that we need to avoid things like uh, bankruptcy and insolvency and inability to pay and all that kind of stuff right? But economic capital, on the other hand, is the amount of capital that the individual institution believes that it needs. And what we're going to do in this chapter is add a couple of things. Look at that first block point, right? So what we talked about before in economic capital was it's the amount of capital that the financial institution needs to avoid, let's say, bankruptcy. But now we're going to add a really cool layer to it. The economic capital now is going to be, of course, that amount of capital that we need to avoid bankruptcy. Of course, it's still part of it, but now it's going to include an optimal credit rating that will maximize firm value. Oh, wow. So this is way cooler than what we did before. All right, what your textbook then does is tells you about two different scenarios. All right, let's suppose that economic capital is this much and regulatory capital is this much. All right, so what happens? If we believe we need this much, but the regulators believe that we only need this much, um, well, notice my two block points down there. The firm is easily able to meet its regulatory requirements as part of this whole risk management strategy and it can maximize firm value without any issues with these governing bodies, right? However, what happens if regulatory capital is this much and we believe that we only need this much? Well, this is called stranded capital, right? So what this means then is that we it may result in us finding fewer positive net present value projects or able to invest in fewer projects, and it might uh, the, it might leave us with some kind of a competitive disadvantage against our competitors. And there's a good uh, seesaw right there. So, you know, imagine, imagine, I mean, in a perfect scenario, right, the regulators would tell each financial institution, you need this amount of capital. And the banks would say, oh, yeah, we, we, we agree with you. This is how much this is how much we need. But, uh, you know, that's not going to be the case. And so sometimes this is going to be heavier over here, and sometimes this is going to be heavier on the other side. Now, how can a firm use economic capital to, to make its decisions? All right, so whenever there's a new product line or a new project, and it has new risk, right? And if, in fact, this is a project that has in general, a higher level of risk than all of the existing assets, then there's going to be an increase in the probability of financial distress. Now, one way to handle this, of course, is just to raise additional capital. And here's an example here. So we've got a firm that has a pre-investment or a pre-project 99.9% .9 value at risk of $7 billion. But if we invest in this particular positive net present value project, that value at risk then goes up to 7.5 billion. Now, if we want to keep our probability of default or our credit rating or our probability of financial distress, that's the example that your textbook uh, provides with you, then what we're going to do is we're just going to simply issue $500 million in new capital, right, to get from the seven up to the $7.5 billion. And then what that means is that we're going to invest that $500 million in such a way that it doesn't increase the risk of the entire firm. So we're going to take that $500 million and invest in similar risk assets as our existing assets. And so in the bottom two block points there, all, all I get to do is give you an example. You know, if it's 10%, then that 
that 10% of the 500 million comes at a cost of $50 million. And so that's kind of the compensation for that marginal or that incremental risk associated with this new project. And that takes us through the learning objectives. Um, I still think that first one is probably the most important. And I think that uh, I, I would guess if I were making up questions, that, that would be what I would focus on. And then the second part is the optimal amount of risk, uh, probably as it relates to credit rating targets. But I want you to think about that optimal amount of risk as the optimal capital structure on that right hand side of the balance sheet. And then the last one, I would go ahead and link that regulatory and economic capital with the uh, previous chapters on those topics as well.